No. Illustrations by Pete. Today I want to talk to you about everybody's freaking out over AI. They're coming for you. They're gonna they're making you obsolete as an artist. No, they're not. I'm gonna tell you why today. We'll get straight into this one. So we finally have a scandalous incident happening in art, but not like the kind where it's, oh, this nothing dot on a paper went for millions of dollars. Not that kind of scandal. Just like everybody's getting very excited about this whole AI thing and they're freaking out. So we are creatures of habit and you may not like that, but that's who we are. So whenever something new comes along, we kind of freak out. It's unexpected. We didn't know it was coming. And we have a little bit of a crazy moment there. So in case you don't know, one person entered a contest and won using AI art. And the artistic world had a meltdown. Now, I want everyone to just take a breath for a second. I understand that these programs may put some people out of work because... Like like a graphic artist, if, if I'm on a corporation and I need a new logo, I can go buy a program and then I just pay for it once and I can make as many logos as I want or commercial art or something like that. I get it. Those people need to be a little bit more diligent in what they're doing. But it isn't going to take the place of like fine art in the fine art world. It's not going to. And let me explain why. There is something that a computer can't do. And that's form a bond with someone else who appreciates that art. This happens every time there's a technology that comes along that changes the way we do things. People become terrified of it and they, they're always going to take over. People get really crazy. They rally against it. Just once we work out the kinks and realize how to use it to our advantage, we can then move on. And that's what we always do. Okay, so we're going to approach this subject in a way that's a little bit closer to our hearts, right? Like a portrait artist. I want you to think about portrait artists. And it used to be that if you wanted a picture of your loved ones, you had to go find an artist and then have that person sit in front of them sometimes for multiple days just so they could be painted. And then cameras became a thing and people can now take a quick snapshot of a person instantly. It's That's it. They remember them for the rest of their lives. That little quick picture. But there are more portrait artists alive in the world today than ever before. How could that be? There are cameras. Because cameras didn't destroy the art community. As a matter of fact, traditional artists also enjoy photography, which is an art in its own right. But why would someone pay a portrait artist a lot of money to paint a loved one when all you need to do is whip out your phone and snap a quick picture of them? And this can apply to all sorts of things like landscape painting and uh, animal portraits or just animal paintings in general or comic book characters or storybook characters. Uh, in my mind, the answer is very simple. First, it's because anyone can do that. It's so easy and common that it doesn't mean as much unless you're going to be like a professional photographer who can make amazing images. And some people even use software for that. And the same thing goes for the portrait artist. It's not common. It's unique. And there's only one in existence when you paint that picture, that image. That's it. There's one. Second, it has your personal touch to it. It's something that only you can create because only you have that picture in your mind. Everything you do has your fingerprint on it and it, it makes it special. A good example is guitars. A luthier can charge a ridiculous amount of money to handcraft a guitar to your standards and people buy them, but you can go get a mass produced guitar for like an eighth or a tenth of the cost. And they play just as good. So why do they do that? It's because of the fingerprint that's put on the instrument by the artist. Just like the fingerprint that would get put on the portrait by an artist. They want their art. Third, and this runs through the other examples as well. People like you. They enjoy your art. They get to know you. They enjoy supporting you. And the piece of your art that you create is more valuable to them than anything they could have bought from a big box store. Which, by the way, 
digitally mass produced art is a long thing that's been going on for a long time. You can go into any store, like go into a Hobby Lobby or a Big Lots or any of those that have any kind of big art for your wall. And they're even textured, but they're, they're created on a machine. That someone did not paint that. Maybe the original image someone painted, and then the machine created prints from it, but they even gave it like painting texture. It's not from a real person. A real person didn't go and paint 3,000 of the same exact picture and sell them in stores. That's not what happened. So that's already been a thing for a very long time. Now, lastly, I want to mention because we're creators, it's built into our DNA. We need to create. And we're going to continue to create no matter how many other, how much other art is out there, whether it's produced by another person or a program. So I just want you to think about that. There's how many artists in the world do you say, oh, I can't produce art because there are other artists that are producing art. The machine that produces art is just another thing producing art. That's all it is. It's done by a person putting in this algorithm and you do this and this and this, and then it creates the art. It's the same thing as if the person painted it, you're just painting your stuff. They did their stuff, you're doing yours. The computer is not going to produce your art. It's only going to produce what that person tells it to produce. And I know they are saying that the computers are now sampling actual artists work and then compiling it into art that they are then rendering. but. What I'm saying is only you will ever create the pieces that you are going to create. It comes from you. It's deep inside. You you just can't stop from creating. So you'll create. You don't have to panic. We are going to be okay. If someone likes it, most of the time, the people that support artists are other artists. That's how it works. At least that's what I've noticed is that the majority of those people who support my art they create art themselves in one way or another, whether they are visual artists or musicians or writers or whatever. They create themselves. So it's creators supporting creators. That's where the appreciation comes in because most people just go into a store and say, oh, look, that's a pretty lake. And they put that picture up on their wall. They don't care who created it. They're not the ones who are supporting the individual artists necessarily. It's other creators. So when you realize, okay, I'm going to support this person because I like their stuff and I like the, what they're doing and I want to support them and you're going to buy their art and that's how it's going to be. So don't panic. Don't have a fit here. Just relax for a minute and let some things happen. Let it work out a little bit and we'll see where it goes from there. There may be a time when you need to panic, but I don't think it's right now. Okay, so last time I did the video about testing this paper, this is the handbook field watercolor journal and it has the fluid watercolor paper in it, not the fluid 100, which is 100% cotton. This is pulp based paper, it's their fluid pulp version. I don't like this paper, I've decided I probably will not finish this book. I, I only had a few pages left, but it's really frustrating me because it's not vibrant and I do I was looking at one of the other videos I was doing and I would think I was doing a short from it the one with the the simple line and wash one and I'm looking at that saying wow that colors pops it's just it's nice and that's the B watercolor paper in the book and it's 100% cotton so it's just it's popping and it looks nice and wonderful the texture is nice this, the watercolor looks very flat and dull. This kind of reminds me of what the Canson Montval watercolor paper looks like. I have a book of that and it kind of does this. It just, it looks dull. It doesn't look very bright and vibrant and I really don't like that. And I struggle with it the whole time I was doing this. There's just something that's not right. And I think that's what it is. I wasn't very inspired by it. I think it came out okay, but it just wasn't what I wanted. And I know I talk about animals a lot on this channel, but I've always loved animals. I talk about them all the time and sometimes I put the little bird things in the beginning or end of the videos. I don't know what it is. I've just always had this love of animals and I've always had animals. Even when I was a little kid, I used to find, you know, baby birds that were abandoned and little turtles that were just roaming around and frogs and we'd catch. We even went 
Don't ever do this, by the way. I don't know if I've ever mentioned this before. This is not something you're supposed to do. It's dangerous, not just to the creatures, but to the people around you is dangerous. But anyway, I had this big grass hill behind my house when I was younger in a development. And we would go around with mason jars and catch bumblebees and, and other bees while they were on flowers. Just put the lid right over them and just catch them in the jar and then try and make sure none of them get out when you catch the next one. and Just fill up a jar with bees and then we'd stand there and wait for someone that we were just playing a joke on to be walking by and throw it from the hill and it would smash on the ground and then they would have to run for their lives. Don't ever do that to someone. We were jerks. That was not okay to do. At the time, it was hysterical, though, because we're kids, and that's what kids do. They laugh, they play jokes on each other, and they laugh. Fortunately, we've never had anyone really get uh, stung badly. We had one person get stung once. Everybody just runs. They don't actually get stung. It was just, but it's you shouldn't do that. You're destroying a lot of different things there. You're hurting the person, you're hurting the animals, and you're putting glass all over the patio, the cement, and people are walking on there. So you don't want to do that. That that doesn't have anything to do with me loving animals. I don't know why I, I mentioned that at all. But I do have always loved animals, and we've always taken care of things. And I remember the one time we had little, we had little baby squirrels, and they were abandoned. They were just crawling around the yard, and I, we picked them up. My, my mother, I took them home to her in a little shoebox with a little, little towel in the bottom or whatever, and she would have to get up all hours of the night, every hour, or two hours, whatever, and feed them something so that they could grow. I think most of them didn't grow. They they passed. We probably should have brought them to a shelter or somewhere else, but they weren't taking them. They told us what to do, and they said, you know, we're not going to take them this time. And it was different times. They didn't always take animals when they were in need. So... We took them, we tried to do the best we could. I think one died, and then the other ones, I think they got up and left. Either that or something came and took them, and we just made a little feeding pod for whatever just took them. But I, I don't know what happened there. All of these stories are not turning out very well for animals, nor are they showing that I love animals. I don't know. Uh, I think I should shut up now, but... Uh, we did, okay, I got one. So one time, uh, across the street, there was uh, a girl there who I was friends with, and she had a turtle, and she had this big treehouse. It was a huge treehouse. Her father was a carpenter, great guy, and he made her this huge treehouse. It was like a two-story treehouse. Well, on the bottom layer of the treehouse, it was just a dirt floor with some grass and stuff, and we put little twigs and leaves and stuff, and there was a turtle in there. And we would, it was during the cicada season, and we would go around and pick them off the trees and throw them to the turtle. Just, here's all the cicadas you can eat. And eventually then we let it go. We didn't keep it forever. We just kept it for a couple of days and fed it cicadas until it was nice and I'm sure it was plenty fat. And then we set it on its way. I don't even know if that's what they're supposed to eat, but that's what we gave them. The insects, they loved it. And we gave them some other stuff, some leaves and grass and stuff like that. And you know, some vegetable stuff, some lettuce and stuff like that, and sent it on its way. And it seemed pretty happy. It didn't have a problem. We'd go over, pick it up. It was just kind of chilling out. You could pet it on its head. It wouldn't freak out or gets too scared. But I think the one that takes the cake for me is I had a pet boa constrictor. And it, it was a Colombian boa constrictor, which looks like a true, uh, it looks like a red tail. They call it a red tail Colombian boa, but because the the back of the tail gets very iridescent and like shines like a rainbow colors it's beautiful tail on this snake huge but anyway we got it when it was maybe i don't know i want to say somewhere around three and a half to four foot long and by the time we had given it away to someone far away in the city who actually knew how to keep snakes Years and years later, we did that, and it was about ten and a half feet, I think it was. But the thing was huge, and it only bit me twice, but it was enough to freak me out, because the times that it bit me is when it was very large. It was at least eight foot when it bit me. And uh, so the first time, I took a little trip, and I was like, okay, I want to let it come out on this. We had a little... Um, 
uh, Chinese red maple. That's how it was out in the or Japanese red maple. Some people get angry when I call it a Chinese maple, even though that's what it was called at the time. That they maybe it's a Japanese maple. I don't know, but it was a red maple, and so the little ones, the mini ones, and so we had it up on that thing, and it was time to go, and I had to go, and I had it curled around a branch, and I slid it off the branch. It was a short branch. I slid it off. But it must have had little nubs underneath the branch, like on the outsides of the branch. And it was, I guess it rubbed it along its stomach and it got hurt, I think. There was no blood or anything. It was not injured that way. I think it just hurt the animal. And it hit my my shoulder, or not my shoulder, my, my elbow. The inside of my elbow wrapped its whole mouth around my whole elbow. Just hit me once and then I dropped it and panicked. And uh, But it didn't coil around me and try and kill me or anything like that. I just picked it up and put it back in the tank. And it was fine after that. There was another time we went on a trip to Florida. We came back and it was very well fed. Everything was fine. But I, I said, okay, I got to take it out and start handling it. Because it was about a week or two weeks or so. And no one had handled the snake. And so we had to. I picked it up, handled it. And was uh, had it wrapped, it was around my neck, and then its tail would curl around my waist, and then go into my pocket. And um, and then its head it would it would go down my arm, and its head would usually lay somewhere past my hand. It was a big snake. So anyway, I leaned back on a china cabinet and pinched its tail between the china cabinet and my rear end. And that was not a good thing, because I'm bending down to pick something up. And the, the snake just turned right to my head and hit me square in the forehead. And its mouth wrapped around my forehead. It was it was just a quick hit again. It was wrapped around my neck. Did not try and strangle me. Didn't try and hurt me in any way. It just hit me once in the forehead. And I had all those little dotted teeth marks all the way around it. You could see the shape of the mouth all the way up into my head and down across my forehead. Then that freaked me out quite a bit. And after then, I was a little gun shy at that point, saying, even though I knew it was my fault, it's it's a little unnerving when a snake that big bites you on in, on purpose. So, but it doesn't matter. I always have loved animals. I still love snakes. I love lizards. I love frogs. I loved animals. I just, birds, of course, have become my favorite. I love raptors. They're my favorite thing. And... I have not had one of them hurt me yet. I'm sure it could happen, but not yet. And I enjoy them, and I just, I love animals. My dog, dogs are amazing. I love dogs. We had, okay, we had a cat now. This cat was something else. It was our cat. We loved her. She was a, not a good cat, but she was our cat, and we loved her, and we always took care of her, did everything we could for her. But she hated people ever since she was a baby and she was spayed. Um, she just it flipped the switch in her head and she no longer liked anyone. She used to corner my sister-in-law in the bathroom, wait for her to come out. And as soon as she came out, she'd latch onto her legs and just chase her. It's just, uh, and one time my father-in-law was sitting in a chair and the cat must have thought it was me. There was a big blanket over him. He was cold, I guess. And he, the big blanket on him. And the cat jumped up and laid on him. And just absolutely, everyone was like shocked. Oh no, the cat's out and he's going on. But anyway, the cat just laid down and slept on him. And then got up. And I walked in the room and the cat looked at me. And well, it got up and jumped down. And then it, I walked in the room and the cat looked at me. And then looked back at him, jumped back up on him, and just smacked him. Bam, bam, bam. And then jumped back down and ran away. The cat was a lunatic. She just, she hated everyone and everything except for us. And sometimes she hated us. It was just weird. She'd just go at us. So that cured me from ever wanting another cat, ever. And that's okay. We had a fun time while we had her... And we're done with that. But dogs now, we've had a couple of dogs and they're sweet as anything and just want to love you and cuddle with you and happy to see you all the time and want to be around you. And that's the kind of animal I like. So that's, we're going to stick with the dogs for now until I can get a raptor. I'm getting one of those. We're, I'm going to get my license at some point in time. 
not now. I don't have enough time to dedicate to getting that license. It takes two years of constant, steady dedication. I don't have that time right now, but I will. This channel takes off, and I can do this full-time. I'm getting a raptor. We'll see about that. My wife doesn't like birds, but it won't matter. She's she's going to be okay with it. She liked the kestrel. She like, did like the kestrel. It was small and tiny, and it gets all the little small lizards and things from around the house. She likes that idea. I'm going to just pitch that until we get one of those. So thumbs up the video. If you are not at all worried about the AI thing, and everything's going to be fine, and you understand that, and you can think clearly for five minutes to realize we're okay right now. Everything's going to be okay. And also thumbs up the video if you have to come back here and tell me off because I was wrong, and really there's no more art in the world unless it's created by a computer, and I just screwed up big time with my thoughts and predictions. That's it for me. I'm going to go. I'll see you in the next one.